Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks to everyone at SAR and to the Mellon Foundation for supporting my research and this fellowship. I think all of us know who are scholars that time and tranquil space to do writing and research is really tantamount to being a scholar, especially a junior scholar. So really appreciate being here among all the special people that make this place great. Um, as Michael said, my PhD is in urban planning and urban design. My background is in urban design and sort of a cultural arts background. And I'm really interested in those connections between policy and ethnicity. And more and more these days, um, the connection to space and migration. Um, so what I'll be presenting today is just one aspect of my dissertation. Um, I recently finished my dissertation over the summer at MIT. And my dissertation focused on three elements of um, urban built environments and immigration's connection to that. In suburban Atlanta, I was looking at transportation networks, uh, ethnic malls and commercial corridors, and housing. So today I'll present my housing chapter um, uh, so as to not overwhelm you overall. Uh, so um, this is my agenda for my presentation today. I'll go over a bit of the context of uh, Latino settlement, or I would say even Latinx settlement. Uh, the term Latinx is more inclusive. The term la Latino is actually used more prevalently in a place like Atlanta where new migration is new. So you may see me interchange that um, as I talk, but it's only because of the nuances and that connection that sort of was very apparent and part of the phenomena of new Mexican migration in a place like Atlanta. So I'll talk about the context of that I'll go over some of my research design and theoretical framework. Um, I'll get into the case study. Um, my case study will be a county called Gwinnett, which um, over the last 20 years was one of the fastest growing counties in the country. Um, and then um, an important aspect of this will be a policy overview, looking at the policies of anti-immigrant settlement um, and also its connection to housing and how this leads to fear and the way people relate to their housing and home environments. Um, I'll go over some basic findings and analysis, and I'll go over some overarching conclusions on how this affects planning in general, but also um, policy and not just for Mexican immigrants um, or just the Atlanta area. So um, let me start with just a snapshot of Latinx growth in the 21st century. Um, it's no surprise probably to anyone here, we're in the Southwest also, that um, Latinx growth in the 21st century has been tremendous. Um, it's a large portion, almost 20% of the U.S. population, uh, more uh, than half of the total U.S. population growth since 2000. Um, one out of every six person in the U.S. is Latino. One out of every four children is Latino, which is actually an important part because as Latino growth continues with various generations and waves, the second generation will actually be the largest growth. And by 2015, will be the 25% uh, of the estimated total population of the US. Just looking at Mexican origin growth in the 21st century, um, about 34 million people of Mexican heritage. This includes both uh, Mexican national and Mexican American, uh, like myself. Uh, so almost 12 million Mexican national foreign born, um, over about 22 million Mexican Americans in the US, US born. And one-fifth of the total population of Mexico lives in the United States. Um, and exponential growth um, coming up in the future of um, all demographic shifts in the United States. So to think about this just and look at the wave here, um, there were major points here um, in 1970, 1980s. Um, you saw the changes of uh, IRCA, the Immigration Reform and Control Act right around here, and you started seeing a spike of increase of both Mexican-born and Mexican-origin people in the US uh, under Ronald Reagan, which allowed a lot of the temporary guest workers coming into the US um, amnesty, and they were forced to decide if they were gonna be circular and come back and forth, or if they were going to stay in the US um, uh, with legal paperwork. So dating back to 2000, um, I created some maps under GIS and a couple of other statistical programs just to give you a sense of the Mexican origin pattern. Um, and I think this is really important to see because for planners and designers where migrants settle, the actual physical location and geography, uh, means a lot to how those migrants are actually incorporated into the society of that place. So here in 2000, we see that the largest areas of Mexican migration are in Southern California, where I'm from, 
um, uh, Texas, and Chicago. And that's nothing new. This is what we expected, and this is what we know. So just keep your eyes here on this area. So now let's move to 2010. We saw more growth, a little bit more here in the areas we expected, but we see all these little dots forming in this area right here, sort of in the south and southeast. And now 2015, and so most of the new growth is happening here in the uh, southeastern area. And like I said, this part here is sort of now sort of topping off. And this is an important part of the phenomenon because a lot of the people who were living in Southern California, Texas, and Chicago are now starting to migrate to places like the South, to these areas that are new immigrant destinations. Um, in 2008, uh, Audrey Singer and the Migration Policy Institute um, released this immigrant uh, gateway typology, looking at the different ways metropolitan areas are categorized as an immigrant settlement space. And you may be able to locate areas that you're from or um, are familiar with. Santa Fe's not on here. But um, sort of here, you know, it's a six-category categorization here, looking at uh, former spaces, continuous spaces, a place like the Bay Area, San Francisco, re-emerging spaces, a place like the Pacific Northwest that used to be mostly Asian and Asian American and now is transferring into being uh, a lot more uh, Latinx. The area that I want to look at in the category is the Atlanta area that is considered an emerging area. And you can see places like Baltimore, Atlanta, Orlando um, are becoming that. But it's not just about the actual city where people are migrating to. It's actually the physical typology of that city and the scale of that city, whether that's urban, whether that's rural or suburban. So here's a map from Brookings in 2015, and the Brookings in in Institute does a lot of research on immigration settlement. And you can keep your eye here in Atlanta, but here, anything that's orange says there's more growth in the cities than the suburbs. Anything red says there's more growth in the suburbs than the cities, which you can see here is tremendous, and it's where most of the growth is, and here's Atlanta under that category. And then all growth in the suburbs, um, some of these other places here that aren't as big, but this is still the largest growth there. <clears throat> After the 2000 census, um, a lot of tensions about new Mexican settlement and growth in areas where Mexicans weren't traditionally found started to take uh, root in the United States and continue on to this day. And this here is an image from a famous, uh, famous cartoonist in Los Angeles, Lalo Alcaraz. 2001, after the census, he used Grant Wood's American Gothic and sort of contemporized it. Has a picture of an elderly white couple here in more rural sort of area, suburban area, and a Latinx couple here. And sort of you can see the tension and fear in the, the eyes of, of here, the elderly white couple. So this brings me to my research design. And the main question that I'm focusing on here is I'm looking at the constraints and opportunities that Mexican populations encounter when reshaping housing in recent suburban high growth immigrant gateways to fit their needs. Um, and an additional question that really supplements this in, in, um, in big ways is how do these newly reshaped places hold meaning for Mexicans in a culture of anti-immigrant fear and tension? And the most important word here for me is reshaping, um, sort of this act of changing your house, changing your environment, your built environment, your physical environment to fit your needs, especially in areas that are new to you and also areas that are not used to um, your cultural life ways. So I think about this not just as housing, but in this concept of homemaking. And this is an image of a mural near where I used to live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, I like this because this mural says, this was on an affordable housing complex, and it says, a house is made of wall and beams. Uh, a home is made of love and dreams. You can't see that second part here. Um, and the difference between housing and homemaking, I think, is very critical in my research because housing is a physical thing. Um, homemaking is the act of infusing these cultural traditions. And various people have looked at this over the years. So you have someone like Bell Hooks um, had a famous essay called Home Places in 1990, where she was looking at racial segregation of African Americans and looking at the ways people were using the interior of their homes as a safe space. Um, Paolo Bocagni in 2013 also ah, sorry, came up with the idea of homing, looking at the idea of these transnational connections and effects that people bring with them and the emotional attachment people have to their places of where they live. 
Um, a lot of the work that I do, even though I'm an urban planner, is influenced by various facets of social science. So I look at different elements of migration studies, especially with the connections to space, the outgrowth of research in new immigrant destinations, new immigrant gateways, and this idea of the, the New South or Nuevo South that has been gaining a lot of traction. But, um, and thinking about different early sociology, immigrant sociology, urban sociology factors, um, I always come back to this idea of the Chicago School of um, the concentric zone and the model of urbanism here. And looking at the ways in which in the 1920s different policymakers, uh, urbanists, were thinking about immigrant settlement in the city. At that point, Chicago was a main immigrant gateway. And here, they had different scholars from the University of Chicago had proposed different ways to think about where immigrants settled. And they would say, if you're familiar with Chicago, here's the loop. And then you get out to these concentric zones, zone two, the slum area, and this would be Little Sicily, the ghetto listed here. And then you keep going to other concentric circles, Deutschland, the German area, uh, the second immigrant settlement here. And things got more and more sort of full of immigrants until you got to the outer suburbs where it was just single family dwellings. It was this idea of a pastoral environment where people wanted to live away from the ills and the immigrants of the city. Um, but the literature in my own field actually that I've been looking at also um, looks at this, but maybe not necessarily in the ways that I wanted to look at immigration and diversity. Um, and I think this is sort of a crux in this um, scholarship that I've been looking at. The ideas of migration studies, always looking at political incorporation or um, civics or religiosity or economic development, but not necessarily a focus on space. And the focus on urbanism, urban planning, urban design theory, that might not necessarily be looking at diversity or ethnicity. So I'm trying to find a place in the middle here where I can connect with that. Um, of the things in the built environment that I've been searching, um, the biggest one that I'll focus most on today is this concept of Latino urbanism. The ways in which planners, um, urban designers, and urban theorists have thought that Latino people actually create their spaces, and because these are agents and actors creating the spaces for them, building parks, building housing, there's almost this uh, romanticized ideal of what a Mexican immigrant wants that doesn't necessarily always connect with the reality of modernity when they're in the United States. Um, so um, this, this, this dates back to the early 1990s, and this is adapted from um, a famous book from a geographer at ASU, uh, Dan Ariola. And Dan sort of looked in the 1990s and says, you know, what are the ways in which scholars are looking at these things um, for Latino spaces? Shopping and streets, murals, housescapes, identity, built environment, material culture, ethnic churches, festivals, and soccer. And dating back to then, you can see that there was actually just a bit on the ways in which people were connecting with housing or housecapes or um, homemaking. Um, in 1993, Pater, uh, an urban planner, actually started looking at the concept of homemaking um, and housing um, for Mexican immigrants and was looking at the ways in which uh, housing differs, right? This is a typical 1950s California bungalow where there's not much social space inside. Everything is divided by walls and different uh, rooms. Uh, but here is sort of a, a house, a Mexican house, a typical house in Jalisco, a courtyard house, where you enter and most of the space is actually a social space. And then everything else that's private is actually pushed back, the bedrooms, the kitchen, those types of things. Um, uh, Rojas, in the early 1990s, um, looked at this as well and looked at the configuration and the changes in housing typology, looking at traditional Mexican courtyard houses here, the American suburban house, and how that gets conflated into the sort of East LA Mexican, Mexican American house. <clears throat> um, at that same time, in the 1990s, the NEA was very intrigued and interested in this idea about Hispanic space, Hispanic style. And so they congregated a bunch of people who were designers, planners, sociologists, anthropologists, um, and artists, and they uh, convened in Arizona, and they published this report, La Comunidad. And um, I'll read this quote for anyone who's watching online. Uh, what constitutes Hispanic design style? The question is easy to answer superficially. The warmth of color, the consistent materials, the architectural ornamentation, the strong and seemingly simple visual imagery, 
the courtyard and the tendency to cluster development around a central public space are also characteristic of Hispanic style that they often mistake by designers, that they are often mistaken by designers for the style itself. Perhaps the most revealing characteristic of the Hispanic approach to urban design is the way Hispanic people use their public spaces. Casual public communications often takes place on and in the public rights of way, on porches, stoops, balcony, and in plazas. The main idea from this, um, for me, is looking at sort of this extent, external kind of social life that a lot of immigrants and a lot of Latino people are known to have, you know, and how this sort of transfer into the built environment. Um, so the growth of all of this Latino urbanism um, literature has been continuing since 2000, right? And here, in just my own literature review, looking at the different ways in which scholars have typified um, Latino urbanism. And you can see no one really has the same kind of um, uh, agreement as to what to call it. Every few years, someone has something different, right? Everything from barrio urbanism and barriology to Latino cities, Latino landscapes, vernacular, magical urbanism, mestino urbanism, mestizo urbanism, New Latino destinations, rascuache, right? You name it, someone said something about the ways in which Latinos use space. Um, a few years ago, the Journal of Urbanism decided to tackle this idea, and it's sort of the basis of where my mind is parked right now, trying to push the boundaries of Latino urbanism. Um, the main question they posed was, how do we design for cultural practices and, in effect, racialized landscape without reverting to stereotypes, which is what a lot of Latino urbanism scholarship has tended to do sort of romanticize this idea that if you're in East LA and you're building a park at the end of my mom's house, that the benches should look like Aztec temples, and that every house will be pink um, or electric blue, and that we all have um, you know, altars to the Virgin de Guadalupe, right? Uh, that defining Latino urbanism requires navigating the difficult terrain between normative views of good urban form and unconstrained expressions and adaptations of cultural identity. And I think for someone like me, who's a planner and urban designer, thinking about the ways in which people have said, these are the, the factors that make a good urban space, and how that might not necessarily connect with immigrants who aren't always part of the uh, urban planning and design process, who may have a very different way that they would create their spaces. Um, Kevin Lynch is probably the foremost scholar in looking at these normative views of urban form, looking at this idea of spatial fit and settlement. Um, the ways in which customary behavior connects with the land. And he uses an interesting example about Navajo Indians living in suburban housing. And he says, suburban housing is matched to affluent middle-class North American adults and unsuitable for poor Navajos just in, the, just in from remote sheep pastures. The newly housed Navajo will begin to change the suburban house and his way of living in it to increase fit, but the misfit will persist and he will be discontented. Um, so this idea that putting someone in an environment that they're not used to and asking them to adapt is very difficult. And at times they may just be sort of uh, complacent and go with it, and other times they may completely shift that and reshape that um, to work with their form, which may or may not follow the policies and the zoning and the land use laws of that settlement area. Um, and, you know, in a very ethnographic way, Lynch offers and says, you know, there are various ways that you can study this either ethnographically, right, watching people in space, or to actually ask users this, themselves on how well this place works for them and what they're trying to do. What are the problems and difficulties they encounter there, which sort of comes back to the research question I, uh, I was approaching. So let's jump into Greater Atlanta and Gwinnett County, which is my case for all of this. And a quick summary about Mexicans and the development of Atlanta as a globalizing area. Um, this here is an image from the ACOG, the Olympic Committee of uh, the Atlanta Committee on the Olympic Games, and you can see here this uh, this was the old mascot. It's a caricature of the mascot for the Olympic Games, and this is a truck taking um, a group of Mexican migrants. And here you can read it says "Temporary People Incorporated" um, back to Mexico. So in the late 1980s, Atlanta wanted to be on the global stage, and they weren't sure how to do that. And they were told that, like a lot of um, cities believe, you need a major cultural event or sporting event. So they decided they really wanted to host the Olympics. Um, in order to do that, they were told that they needed a really, really um, a strong hub airport. So they went after Delta, which they um, succeeded in getting. Um, sorry. 
Um, and, um, and soon Hartsfield, Atlanta became the busiest airport in the world. Um, they got the 1996 Olympic bid, but they were behind in um, the facilities development. And this here is a map of all of the various facilities on the Olympic ring in 1994 that they had yet to build, two years before the Olympics are being hosted and started. Um, so they secretly, the city does not admit to this, but there's uh, a lot of other archival information about this, um, went into Mexico and put out an ad saying, you know, we will look away and not think twice if you decided you want to come and help us um, build some of the facilities we need to build. Because the last thing Atlanta wanted was to be embarrassed after their potential rise into this uh, global city. Um, the Mexicans came, they built the facilities, and they decided to stay. And as Atlanta became more and more popular and urbanized, um, various other immigrants started moving in, Korean, Chinese, Indian. And at the same time, Atlanta decided to go, over a lot, uh, go after a lot of Fortune 500 companies. And today, it's probably um, one of the um, fastest or largest growing Fortune 500 company in the world, Coke, CNN, Rubbermaid, Delta, NCR. Um, Atlanta stopped having room in the center for all of these big office parks and for 500 to 1,000 sort of groups of people. So they all started moving to the suburbs where the Mexican immigrants were counted on to build sort of these sea of houses that didn't exist before in these formerly rural areas. Um, and so that's the story, and that's how Mexicans came to come to Atlanta and decided to stay. Um, despite um, city officials preferring that they actually head back to Mexico. So in thinking about the ways in which I define suburb, right, um, we've got, you know, a, a high growth metro, an area that's sort of a population and increasing, maybe something that's formerly rural, that's now on sort of the suburban fringe. Um, this is the way that I was defining suburb for my research. Something that was, ah, sorry, within 45 minutes to an hour of the metro center, and that there was a metro center, so that for me was, at, was Atlanta, within the metropolitan statistical area for the census, um, and something that maybe had you know, less than a million residents that was still in flux and growing. Um, going back to Singer's typology on um, emerging um, immigrant destinations, um, I decided on Gwinnett County it had, everything was post-Olympics growth. There wasn't an urban enclave for Mexicans in the center of Atlanta, uh, like there was in many other places. So when Mexicans were moving to Atlanta, they were moving directly to the suburbs, which completely threw off the Chicago school concentric model. Um, and now it was almost a million residents, and they, Mexicans were forecasted to be the largest growth by 2040. So, and Gwinnett County has 16 cities in total, with these almost a million people, all of the white areas are unincorporated county area, all of the, which means basically they don't have a city mayor, but they're governed by the land use of the county in the area. Everything that's a color is one of the independent cities, the 16, and those have different land use policies inside. Um, and I think this is really important to know too that most of these cities are new cities. So um, because it's rapidly urbanizing right now and it's totally new, um, these cities are coming up with their policies now. These are not grandfathered in policies that they can turn to later and say, oh, um, you know, we had no idea that this is what was happening, or uh, we had a really bad policy in mind, but we haven't had a chance to change that. So to give you a quick view of Gwinnett County, um, there are almost like three different areas of every city of Gwinnett County. You've got sort of the um, older, formerly affluent, Victorian sort of white neighborhoods, you've got um, the um, sort of um, poor white neighborhoods, and you've got the immigrant districts. And any of those 16 cities that you'll go to, you'll see that, right? And you'll see various strategies of economic development that the city is trying to do. The live, play, um, work, and pray sort of model of um, suburban um, southeast um, economic development. So in a place like, uh, Norcross is one of the cities so you can go through Norcross and you can just see one area completely relegated by all these nice um, Victorian homes that are pretty well restored. Um, but Norcross also has um, increasing suburban poverty where the city won't build, or the rest of the county also won't build enough affordable housing, so Mexican migrants are living in extended stay motels for um, a year, a week, 
Um, uh, you'll see sort of the Main Street USA shopping districts that you might see in a small town, and you'll also see severe abandonment across all of the strip malls that Atlanta was building post-Olympics that now have abandoned Toys R Us, Babies R Us, Kids R Us, Office Depots, um, Sam's Club. I never thought I would see a Sam's Club that was abandoned, but you'll see it in Gwinnett. Um, various um, uh, media outlets, from local to um, national, have looked at the growth of Latinos leaving the city for suburbs, right? Um, Latinos and populations are growing fastest where we aren't looking. Um, everyone's spreading to the suburbs. Gwinnett will be most Hispanics in 2040. Um, just looking at Gwinnett specifically, this is Atlanta and this is Fulton County. This is another map I created looking at different statistics over the last 20 years. And just keep an eye out on um, anything that's changing orange. There are about 10 counties that surround Fulton County here, Atlanta. Gwinnett here is sort of medium orange, and Hall County here um, is the home of uh, Gainesville, which is the carpet center and poultry center um, factories, at least, of the, of the country. And per capita, Hall County has more Mexicans than any other place in the US. It's a small area, and mostly everyone's Mexican, right? So this is uh, Mexican growth in 2000. Uh, this is Mexican growth in 2010, and you'll see a little bit more orange here. And by 2015, most of Fulton County is, is surrounded by large Mexican growth. Uh, I can skip that. Um, in terms of methods, um, I interviewed about 145 people. Uh, most of them were undocumented, which is something that was a surprise to me. I didn't expect to find that. I was looking for Mexican origin residents, whether it's first generation or second generation. Um, I talked to a lot of planners, urban designers, policymakers, social service people, faith-based groups also. A lot of the faith-based groups were helping um, Mexican immigrants get settled, as most faith-based groups might do. Um, archival and content analysis. I looked at the span of 20 years, looking at various um, planning documents, master plans, um, comprehensive plans, legal documents, meeting minutes from nonprofit organizations, and looking at all the news media in Spanish and English and then also immersive uh, participant observation. And because I was dealing with a vulnerable population, these here are just examples of the different ways that I gained access into um, that community. Um, visiting construction sites, volunteering, um, visiting the various Latinx malls, going to soccer games, helping um, uh, translate for different people, uh, uh, various taxi rides, um, uh, going to libraries, home invitations, and even analyzing like license plates at the consulates and some of the other things. In Atlanta, the license plates will tell you which county people are coming from. You'll also see a growth of people coming from the surrounding states who are Latino, who are looking for services that are only based in Atlanta. Um, various groups helped me, from nonprofit groups like the Latin American Association to Welcoming America, uh, municipal groups like the city of Norcross, uh, Gwinnett County Community Outreach and different um, educational institutions, Georgia Tech, Kennesaw. Um, jumping into policy, um, Georgia is really interesting because Georgia is, um, as this thing, as this image shows, the deportation state, right? And thinking about the issue of policy and anti-immigrant settlement in a place like the Southeast is really important. And you know, we're all watching um, the current election here, but basically. Georgia is known to do a lot of traffic raids, and the traffic raids will come for major traffic infractions, uh, infractions um, a broken taillight, um, uh, someone didn't use a signal. And so this has been the cause of most of the anti-immigrant fear and tension in a place like Atlanta. And so here you'll see that from February to April 2017, the largest amount of deportations has come from traffic-related charges, 70%. 30% coming from felonies, misdemeanors, things like that. And you can see the rise, tremendous rise from just the year before where it was only 36% traffic related charges. The two most important anti-immigrant policies in Atlanta, one is statewide and one is countywide. The first one is HB 87. HB 87 is an e-verify policy, which basically means that if you're undocumented, you're not allowed to work and you can be deported for using false identification. The problem with that in a place like Atlanta that has um, so many carpet factories and poultry plants is that most of Atlanta's economy, agricultural economy, survives off of undocumented immigrant labor. The second major one is 287G. This is a countywide 
um, policy that counties will opt into. And basically the counties will, the, the federal government will grant authority to county level sheriffs or local police to deport people and put them in a detention center for any minor infraction. So they're actually, if you get stopped for any reason, um, it's no longer just a county or city or local municipal issue. It becomes a federal issue in two seconds. Um, other things that are county policies that are really difficult, here are this sort of collection of anti-immigrant housing ordinances, AAHOs. And so various counties are selecting to opt into this, right? And these range from uh, ordinances governing overcrowding um, or high occupancy, this idea of camas calientes, uh, hot beds. Um, usually that term has been used in the past for prostitution, but these days in a place like Winnet, it's used for anyone who uh, doesn't have a place to stay that's mostly Latino and they're um, renting a room in someone's friend's house or they're passing through or in one of these extended stay motels. Um, ordinances that have gone into the definition of family, looking at family, anyone related to blood is your immediate family. Most people know that Latino families are really large. We have a lot of extended families. Everyone's coming through and everyone is your tia or tío, even if they're not related to you, right? And so um, uh, this was a really big blow for families there. And then um, uh, large fines. If you were caught violating any of these things or your landlord didn't like that you were violating that, they would charge you $135 a night. Other ordinances govern the amount of cars parking or if you had any sort of construction type vehicle in front, you could be fined. What was the largest amount of uh, work and labor and jobs in Gwinnett County? Construction, so everyone has a construction truck or three. Um, no livestock, right? People coming from rural areas have chickens, have goats. County says, no, they don't, they don't do much work to tell you that it's illegal, but it is a problem when you come up to it. And then unpermitted additions. People are poor, but people are construction workers. So they're building all these unpermitted additions in suburban housing and areas that are life hazards, um, um, but also the only way that they can live. Uh, I won't get too, too much into this, but this is just a level of blight complaint, com complaints um, over the 2006, 2000, and 2008 year, right? And looking at how much complaints have changed, right, and grown. About 10,000 complaints, your neighbor saying, so-and-so has a chicken, so-and-so has five cars. I don't like that, right? Um, you know, this is from one of the zoning ordinances, uh, the Gwinnett County ordinances says uh, overcrowding, one or more persons related by blood, marriage, adoption, or guardianship, or not more than three persons not so related who live together in a dwelling unit, or not more than two unrelated persons or any minor uh, children related to either of them. Um, the mayor of Lilburn, one of the small cities there actually, um, said this in response to an anti-overcrowding uh, zoning ordinance that he was getting a lot of pushback on. He said, we're just a nice clean city and we wanna stay that way, right? And encoded in these laws, right? And like I said, a lot of these are new cities and so these are new laws, these are not being grandfathered in, right? Um, and so you can see how pedantic some of these uh, zoning policies are. You know, if you have up to a thousand square feet, you can only have three adult occupancy. From 1,001 to 1,500, only four, right? So they're really, really watching this, right? Um, this here is an image um, that sort of connects to the whole sort of fear and policy and visibility issue. Uh, this is a, a dad here uh, giving his child through a wall a pair of shoes so the child sort of can do his own journey um, across America. And then here we also have um, the deportation bus. So um, a candidate, a former candidate for governor, uh, no longer candidate, um, Williams put out this bus in Gwinnett County, the deportation bu bus, right? Murderers, rapists, kidnappers, child molesters, and other criminals on board fall in need of Mexico. This was met with other reaction from the Mexican community there that said, uh, this is the pendejo bus, the idiot bus, love for Georgia, and then this says, um, follow corrupt politicians <laughs> into Georgia, right? Um, so the New York Times did a story on Gwinnett County and looking at it saying, if there's any place in the country that we need to look at for anti-immigrant uh, policy, it's Gwinnett County, and that's not a good thing, but this is um, the county that is sort of the testing ground for this, and largely because the county sheriff, which Conway actually has the ear of the president and is one of his local advisors for using the county as a laboratory space for anti-immigrant policy. Um, 
So looking at my findings, this is just a general cross-section of the typology of housing, everything that Mexicans live in. So some Mexicans have saved money and they can buy suburban housing and sort of, um, sort of uh, uh, code switch, right, and live in that physically. Others are living in these big rural sort of apartment blocks or in these abandoned houses in the rural areas of the county or extended stay motels or putting up their um, trailers in some of these abandoned shopping malls or in high density uh, apartment buildings, right? Uh, this woman here, Maria, you know, lives in one of these fancier Mexican houses and she's basically saying, you know, I like, um, I don't fit in here, but I saved money um, to buy this house and I think I deserve it. Um, and she's basically saying, in order to fit into the Mexican cultural ways, I brought in artists from where I'm from in San Luis Potosí to create all these different lions and all these other things. So the back of her house has all these sort of interesting pre-Columbian sort of um, uh, designs also. She's got all this walnut and flooring in a bar inside of her house. She says, but from the outside, you could never tell that this was a Mexican house because if I did that and painted this pink, like Latino urbanism would say, I would be in trouble. Um, so for example, this is a general suburban house in Gwinnett. And this is sort of a Latino urbanism sort of adding these colonnades and these brick arches. But this also brings up this idea that is it just culture or is it economic necessity that people are using, right? Because what they put here in the garage is an unpermitted addition, right? That has nothing to do with culture. It has more to do with economics and class and poverty. Uh, another example, a uh, typical suburban tract home in Gwinnett County. And here you're looking at another unpermitted addition. Uh, most of these unpermitted additions are actually in these large swaths of land that the city of Norcross, which has actually been a very pro-immigrant city in the county, decided to incorporate and say, we know that these people are in trouble. And a few years ago, they said, we're going to annex it and put it into our city, and we're going to help them sort of understand some of these zoning laws. Alejandro from Snellville here says, uh, Snellville is one of the cities in Gwinnett. Mexicans here live in fear, but they also, uh, they still manage. Some of them are able to afford houses from the bank. Others live in trailers or rent homes with other friends, family, or strangers. We're afraid to go outside. Renters don't have any power, and people who buy houses often don't have papers. They need us for construction jobs, but they don't think about how we make our family and what we need um, when we're here. Um, and so um, you can see here the amount of construction um, cars outside of Alejandro's house, right? So that's a citation. Uh, the extended stay um, phenomenon, $40 daily, almost $200 weekly. Everywhere you turn in Gwinnett are these, house, are these hotels. Um, people sort of trying to rent uh, rooms inside their, um, their homes, right? So doubling up, which is triggering all of this uh, overcrowding and over-occupancy, right? You know, um, Gwinnett trying to do some housing rehabilitation, but as there was white flight in Gwinnett, um, people left inner city Atlanta and they went to Gwinnett and other suburban counties. Then as middle class African Americans moved back into Gwinnett and Mexicans moved back into Gwinnett, they left and now those white people are moving to third and fourth rank counties, which leaves all of these abandoned sort of single story ranch houses that as an abandoned house, someone says, as a Mexican immigrant, I need to live somewhere and they take over these houses, right? Most of these houses are pretty poor conditions, right? Um, another thing that people are bringing into their homemaking is landscaping, right? So like this woman brought all these plants, drove them over from Mexico, right? And so all of that connection to housing. That is not necessarily you would normally see just passing with the naked eye. Um, there's a loan program that if you're undocumented, you can actually buy a house. Most of these houses are in pretty bad condition. Um, all you need is your immigrant tax ID number to actually participate. Um, the way I've decided um, to frame my analysis is to sort of think about it as either coping or agentic. There are two different ways that I think immigrants can interact with their homemaking. And one way, going back to Kevin Lynch, is um, just deal with what you have and say it's the best we can do, or um, saying this doesn't work for me and this is how I'm gonna change it. So you saw some of these images before, these collections of trailers there in Gwinnett. This was an old uh, warehouse that people made into grills and different, um, uh, different housing. So I wouldn't say this is the safest place to live, not because it's a violence, just because it's makeshift housing. And you can see here, you know, people are living, you know, they don't have windows, they have leaks, 
uh, faulty wiring. So it's, it's a very dangerous situation when no one wants to help them. Um, you know, but this agentic thing, going back to Maria, right? She says, I'm gonna buy this big suburban house and I'm gonna build it the way I want. I'm gonna paint my house electric blue and I hope no one has a problem with that. Uh, I'll buy my house and we'll pool families, three or four undocumented families using our tax ID numbers. Or working with developers who know we have big families and purchasing properties after we've pooled money um, that has accessory units that they already know culturally they're working with us and they say, um, we know Mexicans have a lot of families, so let's just not get into problems, and here's a space that has actually two extra bedrooms. Um, here in Gwinnett, this was an apartment building. This was a tennis court. The kids who lived here made this into a soccer field because they're so afraid to leave the house. Um, and a 10-block drive, I mean, one of the best quotes was, you'll risk everything for taking your kids to a soccer game, literally everything. And that's true because you drive 10 minutes to the, to the park and you might not come back. Um, you know, this was um, a group of immigrants. These women started this lending library. There's a county library two blocks away, but they're so afraid to go to it and leave their house that they worked with their husbands, who were construction workers, to do a Spanish language a lending library, Tesoro del Saber, um, Treasure of Knowledge, um, in order to help the people in that mobile home community actually have access to a library. Um, the accessory units, and also the training that certain cities like Norcross are doing, these Citizens Academy, to help people learn the zoning codes so that they don't get in trouble. And so um, I was there during field work when they were having one of the graduations. So all these people didn't know anything about planning or design zoning or all the ways they can be deported or citations. Every year there are about 30 different people who come up and they actually um, take this on and they do this. Um, so. Uh, just a few more slides to finish my um, to finish the analysis. Um, I think there's a clear distinction between sort of this agentic and sort of coping mechanism that immigrants use when creating their spaces, especially when it's connected to housing. Like I said, when I started, the, the next the other chapters look at the rise of the Hispanic taxi industry and how Mexican immigrants deal with the county that's fought transportation through various bonds, um, public versus private. There's this idea of safety and interiority, and I think when we look at housing scholarship or homemaking scholarship and research, we always look at the physical parcel and the way it's built, but we rarely look at the ways in which social life is occurring, going back to the Pater diagram internally. Um, is it culture? Like Latino urbanism likes to say that might necessarily be a reductive way of thinking about Latino settlement in these suburban areas, or is it economic necessity? Um, I found that there was this time element that maybe after five years, there was this sort of mutable built environment where people said, you know, I like connecting with these transnational um, uh, cultural ways back in Mexico, um, the way my house used to look in Guerrero or Guanajuato, where my family is from. Um, but after five years, people were more interested in more modern houses, right? They were less interested in connecting with the things because they said, I'd rather just go back to Mexico rather than create a fake Mexico in my house. These regional transnational connections like that were large, and this comes up a lot more actually in the taxi industry and in the uh, ethnic malls chapter. Um, for Mexican immigrants in Gwinnett, this wasn't just a place that was sort of a, a ladder rung suburb where it was just temporary and they were holding space until something better. This for them was where they wanted to be. And so looking at their suboptimal built environment and life there um, was really difficult because they were thinking, how do you move up without moving out? And they didn't see any space for economic or social mobility. This idea of Mexicans as revitalizers, and you can say this for a lot of other immigrants, and I think this is the, the general argument right now with this polarizing topic of immigration, um, that um, who goes into these small towns, these small suburbs, and fixes them? Who takes over the abandoned Kmart and actually changes them into a big ethnic mall that's now thriving in one of the busiest malls in the southeast? Right? Who takes over that abandoned house and puts many people in it and sort of recreates this uh, ethnic corridor? Um, who put in the Band-Aid and the gap for all the transportation needs that don't exist in this county, right? Um, and this idea of gendered housing. I won't get too, too much into this now, but um, a lot of the early waves were mostly uh, single men um, who came during the Olympics. They weren't able to bring their wives and families until later. Um, and this created this really interesting gender dynamic of a lot of these houses are just 
30 houses of single Mexican men living or 30 houses of single uh, Mexican women living. Um, this here is an image from um, a show that was floating through Birmingham, Charlotte, and Atlanta. I saw it in January in Atlanta, in Revolution. It's all about the future of Latinos in the New South, right? And I think for me, I'll wrap up here, sort of um, just these final points. Um, this argument that I'm making that this dem the demographic and political effects on small town planning, I think as planners and designers, we rarely think, and we have a bias on coastal cities or large urban spaces, but the ways in which um, we're all looking at small towns, we'll be looking next Tuesday to see how these places vote, um, is really important, and I think it needs much more attention, especially when it comes to immigrants. Um, um, maybe this false idea of Latino urbanism as a diagnostic tool, we can do these windshield surveys in streets and cities, we can drive by, and if you did it in Gwinnett, you'd never know there were a lot of Mexicans if you were driving through most of the residential areas because they'll look like these traditional suburban areas, and you can see to the naked eye, you might see a, an accessory dwelling unit, an unpermitted addition, some of these plans, but you'd never know 30 people were living there, and if we base our analysis um, on that, then um, we're going to miss a tremendous amount of people. We have a lot of Mexican immigrants in these suburban areas living in gated communities, but um, they've just pooled with three or four families, so it's 20 people living in that house. Um, ethnic diversity is a regional planning catalyst. There's this um, idea that Atlanta doesn't have that ethnicity anymore. It's very monochromatic, black or white. The introduction of Asian and Latino in Atlanta and the Southeast has been very, I think, um, difficult and growing pains for them. And since most of that is in the suburbs, the city of Atlanta's sort of rhetoric on diversity actually needs to connect to the suburban areas in ways that it never connected before. And so you'll see these like, the city of Atlanta suburban housing immigrant task force, these kinds of things popping up in the planning uh, uh, apparatus. Suburbs and exurbs as the key to new immigrant gateways. Um, I, think this is, um, um, I think this was the main point I was trying to make in my talk here. But um, it's not Los Angeles anymore. It doesn't mean that immigrants won't go to LA. But you know, last year, last month's uh, Migration Policy Institute report said Alaska, Montana, Maine, new centers for immigrant destination, especially for Mexicans. And this idea of small cities as a lab for immigrant policy experimentation, that's both good and bad. A city like Norcross doing the Citizens Academy is great, connecting with all these welcoming American movements. Um, everything else happening in the county with anti-immigrant housing ordinances, not good. Um, and like I said, this quest to bridge the scholarship and sort of a built environment and migration. And so the growth of the U.S. Hispanic population looking at 2060 is still going, right? Um, it's still growing. Um, and here, something that a lot of people have been watching, um, Latinos are not stopping trying to come to, uh, to the United States. Um, despite all the things against them, right? Um, if the caravan alone has anything to teach us, right? This growth comes in different waves. Um, Mexican growth now and settlement in the U.S. is sort of um, at sort of at a zero now. Um, but it's the growth of people coming. Uh, it's the kids, right? And it's other Latino ethnicities coming into places. A large growth of Central American, Cuban, Puerto Rican. A lot of these are also climate refugees. They're not just violence or religious sort of uh, refugees, and so. Um, people, the Puerto Rican growth after Maria in Atlanta has been tremendous. Um, you know, as you can see here in this chart, Mexicans are still the largest group, but you know, other groups, Puerto Rico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Honduras, Cuba, right, all moving into this place, right? Uh, last week, The Guardian did a series on Atlanta, um, and many, many good things came out of that, but I thought one of the most telling was uh, this quote, all eyes are on whether Gwinnett will go to the Democrats, signaling a shift in what was once one of the staunchest Republican states in the American South, if not the entire United States. If so, it could be a harbinger of swings in other states that have not been previously, that have not previously been battlegrounds. Um, should Atlanta get the first African, uh, should Georgia get the first African American uh, governor, a lot can change, but these are small baby steps that um, not baby step in that, that would be tremendous, but um, a lot still needs to change along the way for um, Georgia and Atlanta to be a, a more inclusive place. Um, you know, some final parting thoughts is everyone is looking to Gwinnett, other places that have anti-immigrant policies like Texas, Arizona, the string of copycat laws that we have seen. And, um, you know, so this here from America's Voice, right? 
what would Texas, another similar anti-immigrant laws before look like? Just look at Gwinnett County, Georgia. And so despite all of the fear that's happening, I think from a built environment standpoint, there's still a lot of agency and there's some place where immigrants are able to um, be resilient and find a place for themselves in the fissures. Doesn't mean that we should test them to the ways that we've been testing them, um, but, um, but they're making homes and they're making lives as best as they can. And um, I'll wrap up here with this Mike Davis quote that has always been a favorite of mine. Um, Latin American immigrants and their children, perhaps more than any other element of the population, exalt playgrounds, parks, squares, libraries, and other endangered species of the U.S. public spaces, and thus form one of the most important constituencies for the preservation of our urban commons. So this goes back to this idea of sort of being external, um, being social, but also the connection that Latin American immigrants may have um, with the built environment and this idea of Latin American immigrants as revitalizers. And maybe the last thing I'll say is, um, as I was finishing field work, I found this mural on the side of this um, mechanic, and I thought it was really telling and a nice way to end. And so it's an image of uh, two darker brown-skinned people. They're holding a house, and it has some stairs. And it could be like a string of papel picado. And you can see different boats here, people coming over in different ways, migrating. And the words say, we are here to stay. So I'll end there. Thank you.